good morning and welcome to Faith Baptist Church. We're so glad to have you here with us today. Again, if this is your first time here, either at Faith Baptist Church on the property or visiting with us online uh, through YouTube or the church website, uh, we'd love to encourage you to help us know that you were here today. Uh, if you're there, uh, we have several folks that'd be able to help you get a visitor card. Those are located in the back of the auditorium on the left side there of the welcome table. And we love you. If you fill one of those out, just let us know that you came and were joining with us today. Uh, if this is your first time online, uh, please go to our church website, fbc-iwakuni.org. And there you can reach out through the contact us tab, and that'll go directly to me. And let's let us know that you were here with us today. And we're, we're not trying to uh, bombard you with any kind of spam emails or call your numbers a bunch of times. All we're wanting to do is really have a record of your visit um, and then give the opportunity, if possible, to come and be a help to you and a blessing in any way we can. Um, and let us, and we want to let you know that we were thankful. For, uh, we want to send you an email or something to let you know that we were thankful for you being here today. Um, so please do that, whatever you can. Uh, we sure would like to have that record uh, on, on our files, please. Uh, again, we're just so thankful to have you with us. Let's give a couple announcements before we uh, sing our first hymn, or sing our hymn today. Uh, we're looking at, at a few th things that are coming up on our church calendar. Um, on March 24th, that's this Wednesday now, this Wednesday at 5.30 uh, p.m. or 17.30, uh, we're asking any, any and all that would like to participate to come to uh, the church property of the Fellowship Hall and uh, come and put some goodie bags together. What we're desiring to do because of some of the restrictions that are still uh, desired to be in place at this point um, with COVID and all that, we're not going to have our typical egg hunt on Resurrection Sunday, uh, but we are asking, but we would like to give some, the kids uh, a goodie bag and some kind of a gift to take home uh, just to thank uh, the kids for being there. And so uh, if you would like to participate in putting those together, um, would you please just uh, plan to meet at the church at 530 in the fellowship hall. Also plan to bring some candy with you. We need candy to fill those eggs or to fill those back, those goodie bags up. And so we want to make sure we have plenty for the children uh, to be able to have to take home with them. And we're going to make sure they get a gospel tract as well to take home and just, uh, just to kind of encourage them there, uh, encourage them there in that way. Also, we're planning to have several visitors as well for our Resurrection Day services. And so so uh, with that thought in mind and also with some general maintenance that needs to be done, uh, we're planning a church work day on the 27th, that's this coming Saturday, um, at 9 a.m. And so if you can be there Saturday, 9 a.m., uh, to be able to help with that, um, what we like to do is to do a deep clean of our nursery and facilities and also we get some flowers planted in our planters and begin kind of dressing up the grounds as spring approaches um, and also making sure that our auditorium and our overflow is prepared on the upstairs in the fellowship hall for our services that day with the fact that we're looking to have several visitors um, and with the capacity that we have in our, uh, in our lower section, we want to make sure that we have the ability to uh, play the service in both of the uh, both locations in our fellowship hall and in the auditorium. And so we're going to need some help setting that up. And so men, if you could please plan to stay after church, maybe even today. Or if you want to come on Saturday and plan that time as well uh, to do that setup, we were sure could use some help there. And Brother Lawrence Taylor uh, has been so helpful in, in, in making sure that, that has been set up so well and, and, and in a way that's very conducive to putting the video on both screens. Um, and so, if, uh, you know, him and then also the Roush family, Brother Scott and Miss uh, April, will be our point of contacts. Uh, not only for uh, the, uh, the, the meetings here on Wednesday and Saturday, but also with the setup and how that's supposed to go. Um, and they'll have a diagram for how that can be set up as well. Uh, also, uh, with the, uh, with the uh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to make sure I keep track of all the events here. On April 11th, on April 11th as well, uh, we're planning uh, at 10 o'clock in the morning a church uh, break, or not, sorry, at 9.45, planning a church breakfast fellowship, a church breakfast fellowship. And there'll be a sign-up sheet put out very soon for that. Uh, we would love to have you uh, volunteer to bring some uh, juice and drinks like that, or also to bring some uh, breakfast items of your choice. Uh, from what I understand, there's some folks planning to, to do some uh, cook-to-order pancakes. Uh, and so uh, we have all the fixings there as well for that. And so we'd love to have you participate and be a part of that. That'll be Sunday, April 11th at uh, 945, and then we'll be back in the main auditorium at 11 for the main worship service. Uh, and so I want to thank you again for uh, your participation in these things and for all the help that each of you have been uh, to help things move forward. Uh, again, asking your prayers. Hopefully by the time you're seeing this, we've received some good news from the Japanese government, but we're planning on calling this coming Monday um, stateside time to the embassy and also the immigration department in Tokyo and to make sure and figure out what on earth we're able to do at this point to be able to get home. Uh, there's many things that are changing this, this coming weekend from what we're hearing in the news. And so we're looking forward and hoping to being back in Japan by no later than the end of April, if possible. Um, and so please pray for us in that regard. We are desiring to be home, to be there with you 
be a part of, be back physically with the church and the services there, um, and really to continue on moving forward uh, through this time of, of, of really of adversity, as we could even say. Um, I want to thank you. I want to thank each of you, especially uh, for, who have been through this in the long haul. Thank you for your patience. Um, this has not been an easy time for our church, uh, for any of our families, um, and many of the things that are going on. And so I really want to say that I appreciate your great patience, um, not just, and I, don't, I mean that in the, in the biblical sense, uh, just enduring through this. Uh, it wasn't, there's a lot of things that uh, we've all learned through this situation, and so I'm so thankful for the faithfulness of God's people um, and to those that have really invested a lot of their time and energies into what takes place at Faith Baptist Church in Iwakuni, Japan. Uh, with that all being said, we're going to sing a hymn this morning, so if you wouldn't mind standing with me as we sing the hymn, uh, Jesus Saves, we'll sing Jesus Saves. We have heard the joyful sound, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, spread the tidings all around, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, bear the news to every land, climb the steeps across the waves, onward tis our Lord's command. Above the battle strife, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, by his death and endless life. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, sing it softly through the gloom. When the heart for mercy craves, sing in triumph for the tomb. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Well, thank you so much for singing out, and I'm looking forward to now turning to the Bible with you here. If we can go turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 3, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 3, continuing on our thoughts on stand fast in the Lord. And we're looking at various facets of the scriptures and how the scriptures encourage us on how to stand fast in the Lord. Um, and really, we're looking at this thought of standing fast in the Lord in the face of adversity. Um, last week we talked about some of the assurances that we have, not just that adversity is going to come, but also on the assurances that we have within adversity from the Lord. Um, and we're kind of dovetailing off of that thought here as well today as we look at uh, the assurance we have of the provision the Lord has for us within adversity. And so there's some things that God gives us. Um, within adversity that equip us by his grace to be able to stand fast in his person, but also to be able to flourish and be fruitful in the face of that adversity. Um, and so if you find your place there, 1 Thessalonians 3, hopefully you'll remain standing. Um, if you're not standing now, if you please join me here, and we'll read a few verses, and then we'll jump into this this morning. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse number 1 says, Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone, and sent Timotheus, our brother, and minister of God, and our fellow helper in the gospel of Christ, to establish you, and to comfort you concerning your faith that no man should be moved by these things, for you, for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. Uh, for verily when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and you know, for this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you, and our labor be in vain. But now, when Timotheus came from, uh, from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, and that you have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us, as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord." Let's pray together. Father, we come to you. We thank you for the chance to be in the Bible today. Thank you, Lord, for the, uh, just how your word works in our hearts and lives by the power and moving of your spirit to strengthen us for these days uh, that are promised that there be adversity. Um, and Lord, really, we are grateful for the great and wonderful seasons we've had um, even as Americans or in other countries of the world to have some liberty uh, to follow you and, and, to, and to worship you. Uh, yet, Lord, we, we, we would be foolish to not discern the reality that some of those things are changing very drastically and quickly in these days. And so, Lord, help us as we look Looking, as we look to the days ahead, that we wouldn't be uh, unwise and, and undiscerning, but Lord, that we would see this stuff on the horizon, we'd take note and be sober-minded, um, and really it'd help it to kind of jolt us back to a reality, of the, a biblical reality of living with a real biblical worldview in light of what the scriptures teach us. 
And Lord, help us to be equipped uh, by your word to, to accomplish your will and to bring you great glory and be fruitful for you in these days ahead now. We commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated there. And here we find, again, uh, the Apostle Paul talking about this thought of adversity. And he talks about the adversity that they are sure to go through. He talks about the, the adversity that they have personally been through. And, and really, as we look, as we keep moving forward, we're looking at various uh, ways that the Lord not only tells us that adversity will come, but, but not just telling us it'll come, but showing us how we can be successful and really strive to be fruitful in the face of this adversity. I'd like you this morning, if you could imagine a scenario with me. Uh, if you, if you, if you're, let's, put, let's imagine that we're in Afghanistan right now, and uh, we're, uh, a few years ago, back when there was a lot more fighting going on over there than there is today, um, maybe back post 9-11, we can even say at that point, uh, things were hot and heavy over there. And, and the, uh, if you could imagine being uh, enlisted there, being a Marine stationed over in Afghanistan, and here you are, you are waiting in, a, in, a, in an armored personnel carrier, waiting to go out on a night patrol in a convoy of military um, uh, machinery, if you will. And so as you're sitting in your armored personnel carrier, you notice that the time has been ticking and you have not left on time. And so as you leave the carrier, you go to the front of the convoy and you notice that the, the Humvee in the front that is supposed to lead this patrol uh, through a potential hot zone uh, has some people arguing pretty heatedly about something. So you kind of walk forward to kind of see what's going on and figure out what the holdup is. And as you walk forward, you realize that several of the Marines there are arguing with the driver of the lead Humvee about, the, about his failure to be wearing his night vision goggles. And they're asking him what the purpose is and why isn't he, why isn't he wearing them. And the Marine re, uh, kind of replies sheepishly, I, I, just, I don't want to wear them. Uh, they make my nose hurt. And at that moment, everybody just kind of stops and looks at them and wonders, what on earth are you talking about? You mean to tell me that you're willing to, to, to sacrifice the welfare and safety of this convoy patrolling through the night, through uncertainty, a potential hot zone, and you don't want to wear the equipment that's been provided for you to give you a tactical advantage over the enemy that might be waiting for us around each turn as we go on this patrol? Now, we chuckle in our minds about that ludicrous, how ludicrous that sounds, and I wish I could say that is not a true story, but it is, in fact, a true story. Um, this did, in fact, take place uh, just several years ago with a friend of mine who was sitting in a patrol in an armor personnel carrier waiting to go on a patrol, and as he left his patrol, as he left his, uh, his, his vehicle and went to the front of the line, this is what he stumbled upon, and he just could not believe, uh, and those with him could not believe what they had just heard this Marine say. And so these, these, these you know, this, this sounds ludicrous, but when it comes to the thought of not wearing what's been provided to give this tactical advantage in the face of potential adversity in warfare, um, we need to not just look at that as a, as a physical uh, um, wartime scenario on this earth, but understand what the Bible says regarding the, the things that God has afforded to us so that we would have a tactical advantage in being fruitful in the, in the face of potential adversity and warfare. Um, we, we, if you could turn your Bible here, we, well, first, let's look at uh, 1 Thessalonians here and look in verse number 12. He says in verse 12, The Lord make you to increase and abound in love toward one another and toward all men, even as we do toward you, to the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Now, look in verse number, chapter 4, verse 1. Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you have received of us, how you ought to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more. He's saying, look, we gave you some marching orders. We gave you some ways that you can move forward for God. And we ask that you not just take those things to, for, uh, for, to, to heart, but that you abound more and more in those things. And so he says in verse 2, For you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, and that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel, in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, and we also have forewarned you and testified, for God hath not called us to un unto uncleanness, but unto a holiness. Uh, and, um, 
<laughs> on holiness. There we go. I want to make sure I stop at the right spot here. And so with that thought there, hold that there. And, and, and in, turn in, my, in your Bible, holding your place here to 1 Timothy uh, chap, or 2 Timothy chapter number 2. And what we're going to find here is that when it comes to being fruitful in adversity, we cannot just take some kind of haphazard, haphazard mindset about it. We must have this mindset that this is a warfare that we're in. Uh, we have real enemies that exist out there. Uh, the Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We might not always have a, a physical person who's causing the adversity or giving the persecution, but you can definitely write it down that there is adversity and persecution and warfare taking place at all times, every day, on a spiritual level. And so if we're going to be victorious, if we're going to be able to stand fast in the Lord in spite of the adversity and the perplexities of life, and of serving the Lord and walking for the Lord, uh, we must re re uh, grasp that reality that this is not just some kind of stroll through life, but this is a warfare that we must be prepared for. And praise God, he, has, he gives us what we need to be prepared for it. This is what Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 1. He says in 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, Thou therefore, my son... Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Now, now we've got to we've got to mark this kind of verse because we're going to see this phraseology from the Apostle Paul in more than one location. He says, "Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus." See, it, it, the Bible says it over in, in, in Proverbs, "If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small." See, when it comes to our personal strength. There, there's this waveriness to it that we might or might not be able to handle the day of adversity. And so because we can't trust our strength, and because the Bible encourages, not, encourages us not to trust our strength, because it will fail, we must look to the Lord who gives us the grace to stand in the Lord, to stand fast. And in verse 1 again, he says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. That, that grace is this divine empowerment that God extends to us through Christ Jesus in our relationship with him. Verse 2, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be, uh, be, shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. Now, again, let's, let's park this for a second. Notice the verbiage here. Because what we're going to talk about in just a few moments is about the armor of God, or the armor of light, as it's called. Those, those aspects of, of a walk with the Lord, uh, those, those tangibles that we have in the Lord, by the Word of God, that enable us to war a good warfare. And what I love about the Bible is the continuity of the Scriptures, and how when the Bible talks about this warring a good warfare and being fruitful in the face of adversity, it always links it to stability. There's some areas of our life where we cannot be wavering or unsure. We must have a firm grasp of things and be fully persuaded of some things. So in verse 4 he says, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of his life. You can imagine someone tripping over having too much gear. Um, that he may please him with good chosen to be a good to be a soldier, and um, uh, if a man also strive for masteries, yet he is not crowned except he strive lawfully. And so the, the essential two keys here are going to be: if I'm going to be fruitful for God, if I'm going to do something for God, if I'm going to accomplish something in the face of adversity, if I'm going to be fruitful and strive forward and do something then it will be because I have decided that I'm not going to let the affairs of this life, the, the cares and worries and, and the, the uh, 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 covetousness of this life to trip me up, and I'm not going to let myself become disqualified from service because I allowed myself to morally corrupt before the face of the Lord. See, we must not only simply have the right equipment, but we must also walk the right walk if we're going to stand fast in the face of adversity. The husbandman that laboreth must first, uh, but must be first partaker of the fruits. Consider what I say, and the Lord give the understanding in all things. You see, what, what Paul's saying here is, look, it's going to be impossible for you to go out there and say, I live for God, and this is how we should live, but you don't do it yourself. 
You know, for example, you know, I'm sure that the Marine in that first Humvee, if they were asked about wearing NVGs at night on a convoy, they might say on paper, that's the best thing to do. But in that moment, it wasn't comfortable. And so we might say, well, look, we read back in, in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. I, I know that physical immorality uh, and sexual impurity is wrong before the Lord, but when I, whenever I'm going through a stressful moment of life, or when I'm going through a, a bad season in my marriage, or, or when I'm, I'm having some difficulty in my job, uh, I, 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 I turn to that vice to give me some kind of pleasure, because it's just too uncomfortable to live for God in those hot moments. See, a, war, a warrior for the Lord, someone who stands fast in the face of adversity, is someone who's going to choose to do what's uncomfortable to, to uh, in, increase the ability to be fruitful and have success for the one who has called us to be a good soldier. And we want to please him, don't we? We, we want to be someone when the Lord sees us, he says, well done, now good and faithful servant. Oh, our face might be muddied. <laughs> we might have some bumps and scratches and bruises. We, we might have been through some things in this life. But there's just something about standing before your commander-in-chief. And he looks at you in the eyes and he'll say, well done. You were a good soldier. You did what was required. You did what was necessary. And you got the job done. And I am pleased with your efforts. That's what we labor for today. We labor for the Lord to look at us in our lives and to say, well done. You know, the key to our success with adversity will not just be resting, as we talked about last week, in the securities of, of assurances that we have from the Lord, uh, the assurance of his presence, the security we have in that, but also by grasping the biblical assurance of provision for adversity. You know, 1 Timothy chapter 1, if you want to turn over there, we're just a few pages back from where we are right now in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 2, or 2 Timothy 2. You look at 1 Timothy 1, verses 12 through 19, and, and look what the Apostle Paul says here. He says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy, because I did it ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Howbeit, for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all longsuffering, for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him, to life everlasting. Uh, now unto the King immort eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy. Look, Paul said, look, my life, Guy, I received such mercy from the Lord. Dude, I was a blasphemer. I was injurious. I, I was not a good man. I was a persecutor. I, I harassed the church of Jesus Christ. I, 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 laid, I laid them open and tried to harm them. And I was abusing the cause of Christ. He said, but, but I did it in unbelief. I didn't know that Jesus was the Messiah. I rejected him as Messiah. But then one day I was, I was pricked in my conscience. And God knocked me on my back. And revealed to me what was going on here. And I repented of my self-righteousness. And I repented of my blasphemy. And I repented of my persecution. And I begged God to have mercy on me. And I asked Him, what would you have me to do, Lord? So He put His faith in the Lord. And he said, that, that, and as I went forward from that day, He said, I started out just letting God work through me. Challenging me. Changing me. And as I allowed God to do that, I began to see God work that through me into other people. And He deserves all the glory. You find it that all encapsulated in those verses in 12 through 15, uh, 16. And so, or, or 12 through 17. And so He says in verse 18 that this charge, that this, this is the charge I'm going to give you, Timothy. In light of what I've just told you about my conversion experience, and about the way God was moving through me, I have a charge for you as you move forward, my son. He says, according to the prophecies which went before on these. So look, there's some things that were said before of you. Some folks that said some things about your potential. There's some things the Bible says that are given you. And so because of these prophecies which went on before about thee, that thou mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwrecked. Again, this thought, again, of not being entangled with, with the doubts and disputations and, and, the, and the covetousness and craziness of life. Faith. 
and a good conscience, striving lawfully, walking morally and uprightly. The key to warring a good warfare will be what we choose to equip ourselves with for the assured adversity that we will experience as we choose to live out the scriptures in obedience to God. Make no mistake, God has afforded you, yes you, the armor needed for the battle. And you can hold on to that. It is an assurance you can hold on to today. Romans 13, 11 through 14, the Bible says this, and that knowing the time, we've already spoken about the fact that adversity is going to come. We've already spoken from the scriptures about the fact that we're in the last days. You know, Peter says to, to make, you know, uh, that God is not slack as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not only that any should, uh, that, or not only that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And he says, to know that the day of the Lord will come. Look, these, these things... Uh, are moving quickly. What we're seeing today in, in politics and in the world stage, we are finding things escalate quickly to setting the groundwork for, for, for people uh, to see in real time, physically, the fulfillment of biblical prophecy. And it's not going to be allegorical. What you're going, what's going to happen, what's going to take place, will be what the Bible says is going to take place, as the Bible said it will take place. And this is what's interesting to me. I listen, I, I listen to some talk radio and some news radio and things like that. And I'm listening to these pundits and people that may or may not know the Lord, I don't know. But they're talking about a lot of the cancel culture and a lot of the, the things that we're seeing today and, and, and the Chinese government with its a social credit score and all this stuff. And what you're finding is a, a groundwork of a system being laid in, in place uh, where if you don't play ball and don't operate as the, as the woke crowd or as the, uh, the, the political leadership of the day says you should operate, then you will be barred from being a functional part of society. And so because of this cancellation that will take place of people who won't walk the walk uh, of the world, uh, then there's going to be, as people are calling out now for in conservative circles and other places in the world, for a secondary economy where uh, it has its own entertainment, it has its own uh, uh, social media structure, has its own pay structures, has its own websites. Why? Because it's going to separate away from the, from, from the world and be, uh, be uh, autonomous away from the, the world hierarchy of the world system. And so when you get down into biblical prophecy and you look in Revelation, you're going to find this, the reality when it comes to the mark of the beast that there will be those that if you don't have the mark of the beast in the world stage, in the world system, you will not be able to buy, sell, or trade. And so if that's going to be the case, there will have to be something in order, something that's been laid, a, a, a kind of a, a, a groundwork, if you will, for, for a society of people that are living underground to function without that. And so what we're finding, what we're seeing right now is really the groundwork, the, 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 the architecture beginning to be laid for those days. Look, Christian, now some of you might be thinking, boy, Pastor, you're losing your mind. Uh, what in the world? I'm telling you, you better wake up. Read the Bible. Be discerning of the times. Jesus actually, he repudiated the Pharisees of his day. He said, look, you can look at the sky and you can tell that if the sky is red in the morning that there's going to be boisterous weather that afternoon and if, red is, if, the, if the sky is red at night and it's going to be clear weather the next day. You can discern the sky because of what you see in the sky, but you can't discern the times, really? Look, God's given us what we need to know to discern the times. We are, as we are accelerating quickly into those days. And so he says, knowing the time, Romans 13, 11, that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. You are closer today than, you've ever, than any Christian has ever been in history to the coming of the Lord. It is high time to awake out of sleep. Because for, our, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. And let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. The Apostle Paul in Romans 13 is saying, look, we need to wake up to the reality that we are in a battle, we are in a warfare, that Jesus is coming soon, that men and women, boys and girls are dying and going to hell, and it's our responsibility by Jesus Christ to reach them and win them, and it's not going to happen by platitudes. It's not going to happen on Facebook Messenger. 
It's not going to happen by advertisements and cute uh, little platform uh, plays. It's going to happen because men and women who love the Lord and are dedicated to His service are going to decide to stop playing around with the world and start living for God in face of adversity. It's going to mean that those that love the Lord are going to decide that I'm not going to try to get all the stuff I can. I'm not going to try to start play, having all the pleasure I can. I'm not going to try to mess around with trying to, uh, what is drunkenness and what's not drunkenness. And can I party? Can I not party? Can I do a little bit of vice and, or a little bit of drugs? Or can I get away with this? No, it's time to stop playing around what I can get away with and be a soldier and cast off that stuff and reach out for holiness and sobriety and a walk for God. God for his glory but you can't do it if you don't have the right armor see the Christians today though the problem with with Christianity today is we're so drunk on the world and so enamored with what the world offers that we're all entangled and tripped up we have no stability and the world looks at us and mocks us because they look at us as if it were there's nothing different there's nothing there's no change It's just a bunch of the same stuff with Jesus slapped on it and all is good. And that's not how God calls us to be. That's why Ephesians 5, 1 through 18 says this, Be therefore followers of God, dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for an offering and a sacrifice to God. Love is not accepting all the wickedness the world is involved in. Love is being willing to go out of your way to to lay down your, 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 your... your pride and your arrogance and your desire to be received and to lay all that down and sacrifice self to reach them for God's glory with the gospel. That's love. I, I wouldn't give two cents for a doctor who said he cared for me, but he wouldn't tell me the truth. If I've got stage four cancer, I want to know. I don't want to play, I want someone to play games with me. And this world doesn't need a bunch of Christians who are hugging them and telling them they're all right when they know what the Bible says about their wickedness. We must stand for Christ and be uh, be bold in the face of this of the day we live. He says and continues on and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and hath given Himself for us an offering a sacrifice for God for a sweet smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater, hath an inheritance in the kingdom of of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be ye not therefore partakers with them. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather approve them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret, but all things that are approved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, Arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine, where is an excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And over and over again, the Bible illustrates the fact that, that as we become enamored with the world, and the world's things, and the world's substances, we, we, it draws us away from a heart that is given to the Lord and serving Him. And honestly, you know, I, I, it's one thing when somebody doesn't, hasn't known the Lord very long, they've been saved, and they struggle with some stuff. That's a natural progression of sanctification. I'm not saying that it's an excusable thing, um, but l- listen to what Psalm uh, 37 says here. I, we've, we've been there a few times, but I just want to read this couple verses here um, that talk about this thought of sanctification. It says there, in verse 5 of Psalm 37, Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday. The principle is this, believer. Uh, stop trying to make excuses for your behavior before the Lord, and ask the Lord to, uh, to, to change your behavior to mesh with what pleases him. In other words, what we need to do is, is, is stop trying to reason away the scriptures to, to, to feel comfortable with what we're doing 
whenever what we need to do is, is turn to the word of God and turn to the Lord in prayer and say, God, look, I want to please you. I want to commit my way to you. And I trust that your word is true. And I trust that your way is right and that you have my best interest at heart. And so, God, please change my heart and change my life and make me discerning so that I can know what is spiritual and what is carnal. And I promise you, friend, the moment you start living your life like that and you pour your heart in the word of God and you get on your knees before a holy God and you ask God to, to grow in you that that holiness that he has an expectation in you for, before long, you're going to start noticing some things you got problems with you didn't have problems with before. I think it's so funny when Christians who are involved in things that are not biblical, they say, well, I'm just not convicted about that. But the reason you're not convicted about that is because you've not been spending time with the Lord in prayer about that thing. And if you really get, we're honest with God and really we're honest with God's word and you really spent some time about that thing, discerning it, and you allow God to have place and deference in your life about it, before long, you might find that the Lord starts convicting your heart, your heart about it. But it's hard to convict somebody about something if they're not even listening in the first place. See, if we're going to be able to stand in the face of adversity, and if we're going to be equipped with what God has provided for us, we've got to stop trying to be comfortable, and we've got to start being committed. The concerning reality is that we as Christians today have become so comfortable putting off the reality of an, of an imminent rapture and the reality of impending reconciliation. In other words, there's, there's not only an imminent rapture, we can be ta- caught up at any time. And I'm going to pause for on that for a second. If you imagine just for a moment that, that within the next five minutes, let's do it this way. Imagine that I could promise you, I could guarantee in the next 10 minutes, now if it happens, that wasn't because I'm a prophet, I promise you, okay? But let's say in the next 10 minutes, okay, uh, the rapture happened and we were caught up to be with the Lord. In that moment, if you knew it was happening in 10 minutes, in the time between now and the 10 minutes from now, how would your life change? What would you think about, oh, I wish I would have. Oh, man, I've been meaning to deal with. Oh, man, I, I wish I wouldn't have been involved. See, if we could guarantee we knew the time when the Lord would return, there would probably be some things in our lives that need to be dealt with. And the reality is, if there are things that exist that are in our conscience right now that we wish we could deal with or change, then those are areas of our life that we have not surrendered to the will, to the leadership of God, and they are things that are hindering us today from being fruit, as fruitful as we could be for the Lord. And so he says, look, we, we labor, 2 Corinthians 5, 9 through 15 says this, wherefore we labor that whether present or absent we may be accepted of him. Whether he's here or not, we should be laboring so that whenever he comes, as imminent as it is, with the rapture, that we are, we are accepted of him, that we, that, we, that we pleased him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. It, it's going to happen one day. It's, it's, it's like college exams. They're coming, like it or not. And whether, I hope you're prepared. Well, the Lord's coming, like it or not, whether, he, whether by your death and standing before him on that day, or by the rapture, him catching us up to be in the air. These things are going to take place. And both are just, one is just as imminent as the other. So he says, he says that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he has done, whether it be good or bad. So verse 11 says, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, knowing the judgment of God that it's impending, not just for the believer, or the, 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 the trial that the believer will undergo, but even the worst, the, the, the judgment that the lost, the unbeliever is going to go under. Knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God. And I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. Why? Verse 14 says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that if he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. In other words, our, our, our sole mission in life is not to be satisfied or comfortable. Our mission in this life is to be used of God to be an ambassador for what he did for somebody else. Am I thankful that God saved me? Absolutely. But if all I focus on in my life is the fact that Jesus saved me, then I'm missing out on the mission that God has commissioned us toward, and that is to use, uh, to take what God's given me by faith in, by faith in Christ and, and spread that to somebody else because, that's, because he died not just for me, he died for all that are lost in sin. So not only is our attitude or, re, or reaction to adversity going to affect our personal walk with the Lord, but because of what we just spoke about, it, it, our... our, our the attitude and reaction to adversity and, and what we put on to, uh, that, we, that we utilize, that God is equipped, that gives us to be equipped with, how we, how we utilize those things will either greatly help or hurt our witness and fruitfulness for God. 
if the stakes are so high, it makes sense that the equipment provided will surely need to be of a supernatural quality, should it not? And the good news today is it is. 2 Peter 1, 2 through 4 says this, The grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and Jesus our Savior, according as his divine power hath given, us, given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. He says, look, God has given to you, God has, God has afforded to you by His grace the equipment needed, all that's necessary for living a life for God and for being godly. So what is this armor that is provided and empowered by the grace of God that we may be enabled to war a good warfare within adversity. Well, some clues in the passages that we're in right now should steer our hearts and minds in the right direction. Let's note from 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and look in verse number 2 through 5. And sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith, that no man should be moved by these afflictions. Again, there's this thought of instability, moving, entangled. These are important words as we'll find in just a moment. For we yourselves know that we were appointed thereunto. For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer uh, tribulation, even as it came to pass, and you know. For this cause, uh, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know, to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you, and our labor be in vain. Let's look also at verse number 10. It says, Night and day praying exceedingly that, you may, might, that we might see your face, and might perfect, that is to encourage growth in and mature, that which is lacking in your faith. We'll go over in verse, chapter 4, verse number 9. But as touching brotherly love, ye brotherly love, need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And indeed, you do it uh, uh, toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia, but we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more, and that ye study to be quiet, and to do your own business, and to work with your own hands, and as we commanded you, that we may walk honestly toward them that are without, and that ye may have a lack of nothing. And we look over in verse number 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. Now chapter 5, verse number 1. But of the times and of the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For ye yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. It's imminent. It's coming. There's, there's, there's a progression into it. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love for an helmet and the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2-4 through 4 says this, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. Now, with those verses in mind, what was the key here? In all of these passages... What do we note? We note that stability in the Lord through life and through times of adversity will be in direct relation to the increase of our knowledge of who God is and what his word says about him and what God expects of us and how God's word instructs us to live for him. As we grow in knowledge of the word of God and in who God is, it is going to give us a greater understanding uh, and stability in the Lord. Now let's turn to Ephesians 6 and we'll see how this begins. Ephesians chapter number 6. The Bible says in verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. There's the phraseology again. And in the power of His might. See, again, it's not our strength. It's the grace of God. It's the power of God's strength. It's, it's God's grace. 
put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand, here's again another word of stability, in the, uh, stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this present world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. The reason we are struggling to stand fast in the Lord in these days of adversity, the reason we are struggling to stay unified and strengthened and firmly planted in days of perplexity and times when it's not easy, the reason is because the Bible says that there is something about this armor of God that we are not taking upon ourselves and equipping ourselves with. It's not just one part that matters. It is the entirety of the armor of God. And so church today, if we're going to move forward as Faith Baptist Church in the days ahead, if we're going to be strong and fruitful in the days ahead, if as individuals that make up this church are going to be strong and fruitful in the days ahead, it will be because we stop trying to be ignorant and operating in ignorance, but that we become wise and understanding and knowledgeable about what the Bible says that God has afforded to us to be successful in this life. And so first of all, we must, we must exercise and equip ourselves with the stabilizing belt of truth. Verse 14 in the passage, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. One of the greatest factors that will stabilize the heart and mind of the believer is simply to be, to be fully persuaded about the integrity, reliability, and practicality of the Word of God. This is one of the, one of the first areas where the devil is attacking hardest. One of, I say it this way. This is one of the many areas that the devil is attacking very, very hard today, and that is the, uh, the, the reliability of the Scriptures. Believer, look, look, you are not going to be strong in the Lord. You are not going to stand fast in the Lord in the evil day, in days of adversity, if you are not fully persuaded in your heart and mind that this book right here is the unadulterated, reliable, true, preserved divinely inspired word of God. If you are wavering on that, if you're scratching your head about that, if you're kind of not sure about that, mark it down. You are not going to be stable in your faith in God and your walk with Him. So that's what the Bible says, to have your, your loins girt about. This is a, a cultural example of a soldier in that time where they wore kind of a flowing, robish type garment that they would take a, a cord or a leather a girdle of some kind and they would wrap it between their legs and around their thighs and it would bind up the, the, the robe they were wearing to make it more like a pair of pants or shorts. And they would wear it and that would make their legs free to move in the battle. They wouldn't get all tripped up. Just like what Paul told Timothy. No man that warreth entangleth himself. He doesn't let himself get all entangled and tripped up. He, ha he, he, he binds his legs tightly and gets, away, gets all the unnecessary garbage out of the way so there's nothing else hanging off of him. And that's what we have to do as believers. We must, allow, we must stop allowing the fallacies the world purports and uses. And by the way, it's going to get worse. It's going to get so much worse in the days ahead. Because the world has, has a firm grip on all the technology and all the data and all the social media. And, and they can manipulate websites and, 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 and uh, articles. And they can write. And basically what they can do is they can affirm their own truths. Falsely so-called. To the point that when, if you go and Google whatever you want to Google, you could, you could Google why the sky is actually orange or why the sky is actually purple. And you'll find somebody out there who believes the same thing you believe. And so there's no way to really know what's true because everybody's saying they got their own truth. And that's right where the devil wants you. He wants you second-guessing everything the Bible says from cover to cover. Why? Because he knows that if that's the case, you will have no spiritual stability in the evil day. And you will fade away. And you will fall in the battle. We must take note of people in the Bible who instead uh, were fully persuaded in their heart and minds about the word of God, like Abraham. If you turn to Romans chapter 4, you'll see this example here of Abraham. Romans chapter number 4. Romans 4, verse number 16, it says this. Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace. It's talking about salvation. So to the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham. 
who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations, before him whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were, who against hope believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations. According to that which was spoken, so, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead. He was an older man. He was 100 years old when Isaac was born. Uh, when he was about 100 years old, either yet the deadness of Sarah's womb, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was also able, he was able also to perform. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification here again. See, this is a bothering statistic I've read, I've read recently that there's a, there's a growing uh, number, a percentage of people who claim to be Christian, but they doubt the authenticity of the resurrection. I'm telling you right now, if you don't believe the resurrection, you're not saved. If you don't believe that Jesus authentically arose from the dead, if you want to say, well, he was a good teacher, um, he, was even, he was even God in the flesh, but, but he never really rose from the dead. He, he really did die with you know, that resurrection thing. That didn't really happen. If you doubt the resurrection, you're not saved. That is the essential part of the gospel. If, you, if, you're, if you're questioning in your mind whether or not Jesus was risen from the dead, uh, Resurrection Sunday matters, okay? Jesus didn't just die on a cross. Yes, dying on the cross was important. Being buried was important. But if Jesus never rose the third day, he was a liar, and he's not God, and he's not the Savior, and there is no salvation in his name. Everything hung on that resurrection morning. And so, friend, understand, if you want to be saved, you must take all part and parcel of what the Bible says, that Jesus died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried according to the Scriptures, and was risen the third day according to the Scriptures. These are non-negotiables in the gospel, and they must be believed if someone is to be saved. Abraham believed the word of God. Hebrews 11, 8 through 10 says, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place that which he, would suffer, he should hereafter receive an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out not knowing whether he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which he had with half foundations, whose builder and maker is God. He, 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 God said, Go, and I'll tell you where to stop. He said, Okay, Lord, I trust you. Hebrews eleven seventeen through 19. By faith Abraham, when he was tied, tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him even from the dead, from whence also he received him in figure. Look, Abraham went through several periods of portions and seasons of life where his faith was tested. It was tested when it came to, Abraham, leave your, leave your homeland and go to a place I'm going to tell you stop. I'm not going to tell you where to go, just walk. To everything you have and walk. He trusted God. You see, Abraham trusted the word of God when God wouldn't divulge where he was moving him. He trusted God when he didn't comprehend how God was going to use him. He was an old man. He was weak. How could he have children? His wife has passed the age of bearing children. How is this possible? How can I be a father of many nations if, if my wife doesn't have the ability to have children? How is this going to work? But he believed God. When he didn't understand what God was asking of him, God gave me a promise. God gave provision. Now God's taking it. Why? Why? Because he counted that God was able. He was fully persuaded in his mind. He, couldn't, he, would, he would not stagger in these moments of perplexity. Why? Because he learned the truth that God's word teaches us in many places that he never had. Number one, when we don't know where God is leading us, we can trust he has us on a purposeful trajectory. Jeremiah 29, 10 through 11, God says to his people, for thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you and causing you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. God said, look, I'm judging you, Israel. You turned your back on me. You worship false idols. You gave yourself over to debauchery and you followed false prophets and false preaching. He said, but, but Israel, I love you and I'm going to bring you through this time of trial and of judgment but I am going to bring you out of it to a good place. Why? Because I don't mean you evil. I'm not trying to, to hurt you. I'm not trying to malign you. I'm not trying to destroy you. I'm trying to purify you. And my friend the Bible says we should rejoice in tribulations. Why? Because the trying of our faith worketh patience. 
God is going to bring you through a season of adversity. And you might not know where God's moving you. You might not know where God's taking you. But you can trust Him that when He brings you to the destination, it's going to be for His purpose. And it's going to be for your betterment. When we don't understand how God could possibly accomplish anything through us, or if we can make it through the season of adversity because of our own weakness, we must internalize that God is able and endeavors to work in and through us. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 2.13, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you had or heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. The, the qualifier the, is that believe. Do you believe the word of God today? Philippians 2.13, For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23-24, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, set you apart for His service. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is He that calleth you who also will do it. God not only can use you in your frailty, God can not only use you in your failures, God can use you because it is Him which worketh in you to accomplish His will for His glory. You know, Paul the Apostle, though he had his failures, was still able to be used of the Lord in mighty ways after he was saved. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 6, verse six says, For God, who commanded the light to shine in darkness, has shined in our hearts, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, the excellency of the power meeting of God and not of us. For we are troubled on every side and not distressed. We're perplexed but not in despair. Persecuted but not forsaken. Cast down but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. That the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake. That the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. He goes on to say about this reality, about, about you know, we, we go through all of this terrible difficulty. Why? He says in verse 17. Look, look, notice, oh, let's, let's go to verse number 15. Notice the, the perspective toward adversity here the Apostle Paul had. For all things are for your sakes. 2 Corinthians 5, 15. For all things are for your sakes. Not, not his personal, but those that God allows him to minister to. That the abundant grace might, be, or grace might through the thanksgiving of many rebound to the glory of God. For which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perish... Yet the inward man is renewed day by day for our light affliction. Paul, who had been stoned and left for dead, Paul, who had been chased from city to city, Paul, who had been shipwrecked and abused and slandered, Paul, who 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 had undergone so much more in depth, of per, so much more of intensity of persecution than any of us have ever been through that are sitting in this room, right, in that room, or probably listening to the sound of my voice. Uh, Paul, who endured great persecution, when he, talked, when he looks back on it, says in verse 17, for our light affliction, and shame on us when we look at our adversity and we say, oh, this is just too much for me. Oh, it's just not worth it. It's just not, what? Where is the faith? Where is the strength? Where are we standing fast in the Lord? Or are we just going to let life and, and the, the cares of this life and the covetousness of this life wither us away from fruitfulness? No, he says, it's for, but for a moment and worketh, us a far, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, the things which are not seen are eternal. Paul said, look, I have, I, I, if I'm going to stand fast in the Lord, if I'm going to be able to war a good warfare, if I'm going to be fruitful, it is because I have internalized the truth of God's word. Jesus said to, in his priestly prayer, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. It will be because we internalize the word of God, which is the sword of the Spirit in verse 17, the word of God. And we allow it to gird our loins, to strap us around so that we can stand fast in the evil day. We must use to gird our loins, to stabilize our feet for the battle that starts in the mind, will be to start by reconciling in our hearts and minds that God's word is true and that God's word will not lead me, 
by His Spirit to disobey His Word, but will empower us with His grace by His Spirit to live out His Word in spite of adversity. We can say that because of John 16, 13 through 15. Howbeit when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. For He shall not speak of Himself, but whatsoever He shall hear, that shall He speak, and will show you things to come. He shall glorify Me, for He shall receive of Mine, and shall show it unto you. All things the Father hath are Mine, therefore said I, that He shall take of Mine, and shall show it unto you. And what do we have from the Lord to learn and grow by? We have the Word of God. All Scripture, 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine. What's right? For a proof where we're not right. For correction, how to get right. And for instruction in righteousness, how to stay right. That the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Hey, the first part of the, the, the armor that we must embrace today, if we're going to stand fast in the face of adversity, is to stop thinking about false things, as we'll talk about next week, and start embracing those things that are true that we have in the Lord. And we must, if we're going to be able to, just to push away from the false things and embrace that which is true, it will be because as believers, we have embraced the reality that God's word is true, and there's no reason for us to doubt it. How about you today? Do you believe that God's word is true? Have you received Jesus Christ according to his gospel by his death, burial, and resurrection? Do you have faith? Are you, are you firmly planted by faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ? Or have you been doubting? Have you, have you, I'm not, I'm, again, I'm not asking if you prayed some prayer sometime or if you've been religious. I'm simply saying this. If you have not embraced the gospel of Jesus Christ by faith, if you have not repented of your self-righteousness, or your religiosity, or, or, your, or, your, or your sinfulness and wickedness, and have turned to Jesus Christ and resting your hope for forgiveness and eternal home in heaven in the finished work of Jesus Christ. If you are not in that place, you are not saved, and you need to be saved today. And all that stands between you and the Lord is for crying out to Him with the word of faith. Lord, I love you. Lord, I have sinned against you. Lord, I've not believed your gospel, but today I turn from that and I receive the gospel. I put my faith in Jesus Christ alone to be my Savior, and I rest in his finished work of what he did for me on the cross of Calvary in his death, burial, and resurrection, dying for my sin so that I might have a right stance before you. That is the prayer, not just necessarily the words necessarily, but the, the, the faith and the communication behind it, of, of the faith in the finished work of Christ. How about you today? Have you trusted Jesus as your Savior? Or are you resting in a false gospel? Or are you resting in what's not true or looking after that which is temporal? Are you a warrior that is engaged in the battle for God? And if that means, if you, if you are a warrior, it means you've put off some things that are entanglements and you're stretching and you're striving forward for the cause of Christ. Is that your heart today? If not, there's time right now as we get ready to close in just a moment to pray. As you go home this afternoon, meditate and think on what's been spoken today from the Word of God, not just what I said. What I say, mm -mm, that can go either here or there. It only matters if it comes from what the Bible says. This book matters. And I tried the best I could to preach that which is right according to this book. So I, have, I, I invite you with me this week to think about what the Bible says about being a warrior, that war is a good warfare. And if we're going to be able to do that, it's going to be because we embrace and we put on the whole armor of God and cast off those unfruitful works of darkness the Bible talks about. And I look forward to talking more about this in the, days, in the weeks ahead. But let's be praying about truth this week. Are we fully persuaded? Let's pray. Stand together and pray. Father, we come to you now. Thank you again for today. We thank you for a chance to be in your word. God, we ask you to search our hearts and see if there be any way in us that is not in accordance with your word. Any way in us that, that, that is distracted away from your word. Any way in us that is, refuses to believe your word. And God, help us to be a people that repents of that and, and embraces your word as truth and walks according to it by your spirit so that we can have a better understanding of what you'd have us to do and a better discerning of, discernment of what you expect from us. Lord, again, we love you and thank you for today. And we ask if there's somebody in here who is not saved, they do not know you as their savior, that today would be the day that they put their faith and trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ once and for all to be saved and born again and to have that transformational new nature that only comes by, a, by, by a, a, a relationship with Jesus Christ by the Spirit of God. God, help us today. Help us, Lord, to honor you and to please you. Lord, help us to war good warfare 
in the day we live and help us to be fruitful for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for being with us again today. Look forward to seeing what God will work in the days ahead. We ask you to be praying for us. We're praying for you. And we'll hopefully, Lord willing, see you in the near future. Have a great rest of your week. God bless.